Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Nuclear Energy. Now we're going to begin with section 3.4, Nuclear Reactors and the Issues Involved, and that's on page 19. All right, the rest of the sections involving calculations will be covered during the lecture. Now let's take a look at nuclear reactors. Now, nuclear reactors are used to produce electric power. How is this produced? Now, in general, over here, you can see in part K, that's where the nuclear fuel is. When the nuclear fuel is close together, it produces an intense amount of heat due to nuclear fission. This heat is then used to boil water in a steam generator, and the steam generator goes to um, rotate a turbine in part H, and a the turbine then rotates the electrical generator in part G. Now the steam from this turbine is then recovered and pumped back into part D again. In general, the reactor is a closed chamber so that the dangerous radioactive substances should not be released into the environment. Okay, so let's take a look at the text. Many problems are often associated with nuclear power plants. The problems of the nuclear power plants are mainly the disposal of the radioactive fission fragments produced in the reactor, plus the radioactive nucleides produced by neutrons. So basically what uh, happens is that the nuclear power plant produces a small amount of radioactive waste every year, but this radioactive waste needs to be carefully managed and controlled. It can't just be disposed anywhere. The second uh, danger of nuclear power plants is the accidental release of highly radioactive fission fragments into the atmosphere um, during accidents such as Trima Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. However, uh, you know, generally nuclear power is relatively safe uh, if you know, uh, catastrophes do not occur. So nuclear power represents some risk. However, other large-scale energy conversion methods such as conventional coal burning also present health and environmental hazards. So the biggest problem right now with today's fossil fuel is the release of carbon dioxide gas, which will be trapping heat in the greenhouse effect and raising the Earth's temperature. So nuclear power potentially offers a very high energy alternative to fossil fuels, which can help prevent the greenhouse effect from happening on Earth. However, we still need to um, think about what to do with the radioactive waste, as well as to find ways to prevent radioactive uh, ra uh, nuclear accidents from happening. Until then, I think there will be a lot of public opposition to nuclear power plants. However, Singapore is considering taking up a nuclear power station. Right within the next 50 or 100 years, Singapore will probably be moving towards nuclear power. Now let's move on to chapter four, radioactivity. Now what's special about radioactivity is that it is natural. This radioactivity happens, occurs in nature uh, among radioactive elements and is not man-made. All right, let's move on to radioactive decay. Now uh, for radioactive, radioactivity, it refers specifically to three kinds of radioactive uh, decays. Firstly, alpha decay, secondly, beta decay, and thirdly, gamma decay. So radioactive decays only refer to these three types of radioactivity. Now, radioactive decay is described as spontaneous and random. Now, only within the meaning of radioactive decay, the word spontaneous has this meaning for this chapter only. Okay, the word spontaneous in radioactive decay means that the radioactive decay is not affected by external conditions. So, for instance, you cannot increase the pressure on a radioactive substance to cause it to become more radioactive or to increase the activity level. Neither can you affect the decay of the radioactive substance by increasing the temperature or other using magnetic or electric fields to induce further radioactive decay. It's not possible. Now, for radioactive decay, it's also described as a random process. It is impossible to predict which nucleus will decay next, and there is a constant probability that a nucleus will decay in a fixed amount of time. 
So please remember, in, new, in radioactive decay, which is a natural process, it refers only to three kinds of radioactivity, alpha, beta, and gamma. And the, the radioactive decay is described as spontaneous and random. It's a natural process. Unlike the induced man-made radio, radioactive uh, nuclear reactions that we have talked about earlier in the chapter. Now, what about uh, how is uh, radioactive decay uh, demonstrated? Now, radioactive decay, like all other, uh, uh, like alpha, beta, and gamma rays, can be detected in a Geiger Muller tube. Now, I'm going to show you a video about uh, Geiger Muller tubes or Geiger counters. So let's watch this video and learn more about them. There's a couple of my radiation detectors, the Radex RD1706 and the very basic DRSP01 Russian detector. I have here a piece of pitch blend uranium ore. It's keeping uranium ore in a butter box. So let's That's have so a look scary. How active this is. It's quite active this piece. All right, so uh, what we saw in the video, okay, was a Geiger-Muller tube or, or GM counter, sometimes called a Geiger counter. Now, this Geiger counter is able to read the number of radioactive ions or radioactive particles passing through the Geiger counter. So it gives an indication of the radioactivity uh, of the sample that he's uh, using. Now, notice that... Uh, when the uranium was inside this butter box, okay, the Geiger counter could barely read anything. And then when he took off the lid of this plastic box, the Geiger counter immediately started going crazy. Now this is an indication that the uranium ore is actually emitting alpha radiation, which is easily blocked by a thin plastic sheet. Okay, so when the Geiger Muller tube is near a radioactive source, all right, so it will be able to read uh, every uh, uh, every radioactive uh, ionization particle, uh, whether uh, alpha or beta radiation passing into the Geiger Muller tube, okay, and record it as a pulse. Now, let's talk about the types of radiation. Now, the first type of radiation uh, that is quite common uh, in nature is called alpha radiation. Now, alpha particles are helium nuclei. I'm going to show you a video of alpha radiation right now. Now let's take a look at this video. This video shows us alpha radiation coming out of a radioactive uh, material that's over here in this little metal chamber. Now this enclosure that we see here, this is called a cloud chamber. A cloud chamber contains uh, alcohol vapor at very high saturation and very low temperature. So what happens is that the alpha radiation, alpha particles rush out a very, very high speed and they cause ionization to occur in the gas. When the gases ionize, it causes condensation of the uh, alcohol vapor into little alcohol droplets. And so you can see the trails. It's really quite beautiful, isn't it? Now notice how the alpha particles all have a very short length of about maybe four centimeters and they are coming out all the time. Now you can't really tell where the next alpha particle is going to come out, so it's quite random, but you do know that it's going to come out within this area. Okay, so this is alpha radiation. Now let's read more about alpha radiation. Alpha particles are actually helium-4 nuclei. So all those little streaks that you saw just now are helium nuclei going very, very fast. In most cases, the alpha particles emitted have ranges in the range of a few um, mega electron volt, so maybe about 4 to 5 MeV kinetic energy. But this means that the speed of alpha particles is in the order of tens of millions of meters per second. Alpha particles are positively charged with a plus 2E charge, and so they're deflected by a strong magnetic field, and they are also deflected by an electric field. Alpha particles have a very high ionizing power, okay, and they only travel about 3 to 4 centimeters in air. They are easily stopped by a piece of paper. That's easy. Now, 
alpha, alpha decay is represented by the following equation. Let's take a look at how alpha decay is represented. Over here, you can see the uranium-238, 92 protons, decays into thorium-234 and 90 plus an alpha particle, helium-42. Okay, now this, this uh, helium-42 is the alpha particle. The gamma over here is not alpha particle. All right, what is the gamma actually? Now the gamma, uh, particle over here is actually um, part of the gamma radiation. Oops. So just wanted you to note that this uh, gamma particle over here is gamma radiation. It's not alpha radiation, but it often follows after an alpha particle is released. This one is the alpha radiation. Okay. So another example of an alpha decay is 230 thorium. The top number minus 4, the bottom number minus 2. To get 22688 radium and 42 helium. Once again, this gamma particle over here is not alpha radiation. Okay, let's take a look at the next type of particle, beta particle. Once again, I'll show you a video of beta particles. Now over here, let's take a look at uh, a cloud chamber again. This time, this cloud chamber is just recording natural background radiation. Okay, there's no radioactive source nearby. Now what I want you to notice is the squiggly lines across the right hand side of the screen. These squiggles are all beta particles. You notice one thing is that they have varying lengths. They have uh, varying paths. Some are longer, some are shorter. Okay, some can be very, very long and some can be very, very short. This is a characteristic of beta particles. They don't all have the same length. Alpha radiation, on the other hand, is very distinct. Watch this over here. Uh, this is the alpha radiation. Everything else over here is beta radiation. Some are longer, some are shorter, and they have squiggly paths. Let's see if we can distinguish between alpha and beta radiation. Let's wait. Alpha radiation. Okay, let's wait. Alpha radiation. Let's wait, 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 wait. One more alpha. Come on. One more alpha. One more alpha radiation? No? The rest are all squiggly. Oh, alpha radiation. Okay? Right. So now you can distinguish between alpha and beta radiation. Beta radiation is a squiggly lines that have uh, varying lengths. Okay. Now, beta particles are actually uh, electrons. Can we actually write down here? The Cambridge definition of beta particles is extremely high speed electrons. Please uh, write down the... Um, the letters here, high-speed electrons. Now, they are emitted when neutrons in the nucleus decays into protons. Beta particles are emitted with a range of speeds and can be very fast, traveling up to 50% of the speed of light. Now, I'm going to explain something over here, okay, which is that beta particles don't come out on their own. Let me just tell you how beta particles arise. A neutron, remember neutrons are those neutral uh, Nuclear uh, nucleons in the nucleus will become a proton plus an electron, okay, plus something called a neutrino. Now, the discovery of the neutrino was a relatively recent thing. I think it was discovered in the 1950s. Okay, but the existence of the neutrino was theorized long before it was discovered. Okay, let's ex let's uh, uh, try to understand why. There is such a thing called a neutrino. Now, let's take a look at the energy released in any beta particle decay. I'm going to give you an example. The energy that is released uh, based on mass difference, okay? The energy that is released based on net mass difference, it should be 0 0.51 mega electron volt. But when you measure the kinetic energy of the beta particle, Ke of the beta particle, it can be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.05, or up to 0 0.51 MeV. So how can it be the case that the energy release is supposed to be 0 0.51 MeV 
But when you measure the Ke of the beta particle, there's a range between 0, 0.0 all the way to 0 0.51 MeV. How can the beta particle not have a fixed amount of energy? So here's the theory. There is another particle that is having the Ke of this unknown value such that when you add it up, the, you get 0 0.51. So for example, down here could be 0 0.46 MeV. Then over here, the other particle has 0 0.41 uh, uh, MeV, 0 0.31 you know, MeV, and all the way, all the way to 0, 0.0. So this means that there the energy that is released is shared between the electron and the neutrino. Okay, so let's take a look back at the notes again. What does this mean? Now, beta particles are emitted with a range of speeds. That means they have a varying Ke. So the products of a beta decay cannot just consist of the proton and electron because that would imply that both of them must have a fixed amount of speed so that it adds up to 0 0.51 in order for linear momentum to be conserved. Now, another uh, telling... Uh, uh, evidence that there must be a third particle released during the beta decay is that the daughter nuclei, which is the proton, uh, the, 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 the decay products, does not recoil back in a straight line but at an angle, which also violates conservation of linear momentum. Now let me give you an example of what I mean over here. Now suppose I have a gun and a bullet. Now when I fire the gun, the gun must go backwards and the bullet must go forwards. So let's say we have a, a, a particle over here, x. Then after that, it becomes y plus a beta particle. So you expect that the beta particle will move forward and then the, the, the other particle will move backwards. Sorry if I have blocked it just now. Now what happened during beta decay is that there's a gun, but when it's fired, the gun goes in this direction, but a bullet goes in this direction. How can that be possible unless there is a third imaginary bullet that goes in this direction, invisible bullet, I mean, which goes in this direction so that the momentum is conserved. Okay, so this is what it means that the daughter nuclei and the beta particle do not, okay, actually uh, recoil in opposite directions, but instead they recoil at an angle to each other. Now, so based on these two evidences that, first of all, the beta particle has a range of speeds, and second, the daughter nuclei did not recoil in a straight line uh, 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 compared to the beta particle, but at an angle. It means that there must be a third particle in the beta decay process. This particle is determined to be the neutrino. Okay, now later on, I'll show you how to write the beta decay uh, equation together with the neutrino. But let's first talk about beta particles. Beta particles are easily deflected by a magnetic electric field because electrons are very light. They have low mass. They have also uh, less ionizing power of beta particles. It's about 1 to 10 compared to that of alpha particles, primarily because of their lower charge and also because of their smaller size. So they have a lower charge of minus 1e compared to the alpha particles of plus 2e. Now the range of particles in air is about 10 times that of alpha particles and they can be stopped by uh, aluminium. Now let's talk about the beta decay equation. Now the beta decay equation works like this. The beta particle electron is given zero nuclear mass, uh, considered to be zero nuclear number, and minus one charge okay so what this means is that the the top number over here two three four will be two three four plus zero now the neutrino is zero zero okay that means it's got no nuclear number and also no charge okay so the bottom over here thorium 90 becomes palladium plus my uh, negative one charge of the electron okay let's take a look at the completed uh uh, completed uh, equation again. All right, so let's double check. 2, 3, 4 over here equals to 2, 3, 4 plus 0 plus 0. The top row is correct. Let's look at the bottom row. 90 equals to 91 
minus 1 plus 0. Bottom row is also third. So this is the beta decay equation. Now next, let's move on to the gamma rays. Gamma rays are actually electromagnetic rays. Uh, basically, it's light of a wavelength that's even more powerful, shorter than that of X-rays. So in general, gamma rays are slightly more powerful than X-rays. Gamma rays are electrically neutral and they are not deflected by electric magnetic fields. So they also have the strongest penetrating power and the weakest ionization power. So in general, gamma rays may or may not be detected by a Geiger molecule. tube. Now, gamma rays represents the emission of energy from a nucleus which is returning to its ground state. So one example of a gamma radiation is, let's say, thorium. The asterisk over here represents excited. Okay, this is the excited thorium. The thorium which is excited will then become normal thorium plus gamma radiation. Okay, gamma radiation also has a value of 0, 0 for nucleon number and 0 for the charge. Okay, so this is uh, uh, an example of a gamma K uh, equation. Here's a summary of the properties of ionizing radiation. There are three kinds of natural radioactivity. The first kind is alpha particles, which are helium. The second kind are beta particles, which are electrons. And the third kind of gamma rays of radiation are called gamma rays, which is light. Okay, the charge of the helium nucleus is plus 2e. The charge of the electron is minus e. The helium and the electrons are deflected by electric and magnetic fields, but gamma radiation is undeflected. Okay, uh, for alpha particles, the energy of the alpha particle is, uh, all alpha particles have about the same amount of energy, but for beta particles, they have very different energies when they come out because some of the energies shared with the neutrino. For gamma radiation, they also have very similar energies when they come out. Now, for the range in air, the alpha particles only travel a few centimeters. Beta particles can travel from half a meter up to several meters. And gamma rays will actually travel uh, in uh, infinite distances uh, subject to whether or not it's absorbed by any other material. Okay. Alpha particles are the most ionizing but least penetrating, and gamma rays are the least ionizing but the most penetrating. Okay, now let's move on. So this uh, diagram shows you how alpha, beta, and gamma rays are deflected in a magnetic field. Now let's use our Fleming's left-hand rule to determine which direction alpha particles will deflect. Now over here, the alpha particles are positive charges. So when positive charges are traveling out from the source in this direction, okay, this is your current is here, your B field is into the page, so your force will be to the left. Now, beta particles, on the other hand, are negative charges. So for beta particles, when they're traveling in this direction, the current will be backwards, the B field is into the page, so the force will be to the right, okay? So gamma rays uh, are uncharged, so they don't have any deflection in the magnetic field. Okay, let's look at example number eight. A certain radioactive nuclei of mass number mx disintegrates with the emission of an electron and gamma radiation only. We give a second nuclei of mass number my. Which of the following equations correctly relates mx and my? The answer is D. Okay, now, so give you an example x over here, 90 and 45. Okay, I'm just making up the numbers. Becomes y plus 0 minus 1 e plus 0, 0 gamma. Okay, so uh, if you look at the top row, the top row has to be balanced out, so that must be 90 over here. Look at the bottom row, the bottom row must also balance out, so this must be 46 over here. So they only ask for mx and my, so look at that, 90 and 90, they must be the same as each other. Okay, so that's the uh, nuclear reaction uh, equation for uh, beta, alpha, beta, and gamma decays. Now we're going to skip a couple of chapters after this. We're going to go on to chapter number six. Chapter number six tells us about the harmful effects of radiation on living organisms as well as the useful aspects of radio radiation. Now, 
the harmful effects to living organisms from radiation okay uh come from uh three types of sources now alpha radiation is not going to be super duper harmful because they cannot penetrate the outer layers of the skin maybe the most that can give you is skin cancer so beta radiation however goes into your surface tissues and a few mm uh a few mm into your body all right now a few millimeters of aluminum is sufficient to provide adequate protection so beta radiation is also not super duper harmful gamma radiation however is highly penetrating it will go all the way through your body all right and be absorbed by your bones now if you have radioactive substances on the outside of your body then that's kind of like controllable because they can be washed off now so you can wash off the radioactive particles however if you somehow breathe in the radioactive particles inside your lungs then you are in super trouble because the radioactive particles are now inside your body and they are all going to cause a radiation damage within your cells and they can't easily be removed from your body and they might stay there for a very long time okay so radiation causes several uh, effects to your body tissue now the first one is immediate severe effects such as radiation burns okay next this is like going to happen immediately within the next few hours now delayed effects can also occur many years later such as cancer so these are delayed effects the third kind of radiation damage is even more insidious now hereditary defects may also occur if the radiation damages the set cells in your body such as the eggs so the radiation is going to cause genetic mutation damage which will pass on to your children all right so the children when they grow up will be deformed or mutated in some way often leading to uh, suboptimal results okay now uh, let's take a look at uh, parts of the body that are extremely vulnerable to radiation chromosomes are very sensitive to ionizing radiation basically your dna so radiation causes cell death by damaging the dna of the cells let's move on to the next part uses of radiation now in general radiation also has very uh, uh, good industrial uses the first kind of uses of radiation is as trade is to use in tracers now what is the meaning of a tracer suppose you have a long pipeline underground and you don't know well whether or not there's a leak somewhere so what you do is that you add a radioactive isotope in the oil and the pipe will carry the oil all the way if there is a leak the the radioactive substance will escape into the ground leading to a high count rate near the leak so what you have is that uh, you have a man or you have a machine carrying a radiation detector and when the radiation detects the leak all right, you know that over here there's going to be a very high count rate so that's where the leaks gonna occur so clearly uh, they will use uh, radioactive particles with a half-life of just a couple of days so that the radiation doesn't stay in the ground after the inspection is done now for medical and biological users okay uh, radiation kills cells so what happens is that you can use radiation to kill cancer cells the radiation causes cancer radiation can also cure cancer also oh, often cancer cells are rapidly growing and so they are much more likely to be killed by a high dose of gamma radiation now apart from uh, uh, curing uh, cancer or killing cancer cells um, radioactive uh, medical traces can also be used inside the body uh, to find cancers now what happens here is that uh, uh, a radioactive glucose or radioactive sugar is injected into the body and the sugar is rapidly absorbed by cancer cells which actually consume a lot of uh, energy or consume a lot of the sugar from the body so these cancer cells will light up with uh, uh, will emit radi radiation and that can be detected by medical instruments okay 
The next kind of use of radiation is in carbon dating, called archaeological dating. Now, I need you to uh, uh, change this uh, number over here. The half-life of carbon-14 is actually 5,700 years. Okay, now let's talk about uh, sources of radioactive carbon. Now, every day in the air, radioactive carbon dioxide is produced. What happens is that uh, cosmic radiation from space causes nitrogen in the atmosphere, which is generally harmless, to, uh, to, com to be converted by a process called neutron capture, all right, to a carbon-14 atom. Now, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon, and this is then uh, reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere to form radioactive carbon dioxide. Every day, this happens, and a set amount of carbon-14 is produced in our <coughs> atmosphere. This radioactive carbon dioxide is then uh, you, uh, converted into sugars, radioactive sugar by the trees and plants, and these radioactive sugars are then eaten by animals. So inside all our bodies right now, as long as you eat plants or eat animals that are made from uh, that also eat plants, you will have a certain amount of radioactive carbon-14 in your body. However, once you die, you stop eating carbon-14 and the carbon-14 in your body starts to disappear or decay. And so the amount of carbon-14 left in your body can determine how much time has passed since you passed away, not you, I mean the animal. So the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. Once the plant has died, no further carbon-14 is taken in, so the proportion of carbon-14 in the plant starts to decrease. After one half-life of 5,700 years, the proportion of carbon-14 remaining is down to 50%, and so on and so forth. Now, this uh, has a limit of around uh, 20,000 years uh, limit, after which uh, the amount of carbon-14 remaining is too small to be accurately measured. So archaeological carbon-14 dating is good for about 20,000 years in the past. Okay. So let's talk about some safety precautions in handling uh, radiation. Okay. Now, so safety precautions for handling radiation are very simple. Reduce exposure, increase your distance from the radioactive source, and wear protective clothing. So over here, reduce the time of uh, actually handling the radioactive substance. Over here, increase the distance from the radioactive source by using tongs, okay, or using robots or robotic arms to actually uh, handle the substance instead of you. And over here, have a radioactive absorbing barrier to prevent, to actually stop the radioactive uh, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation from reaching your body. Okay, protective clothing. So the storage of radioactive uh, materials is also very important. Pure alpha particles uh, represent very little hazard. So it, the guy was storing it in a plastic butter box, which I do not recommend. Okay. Now, uh, so uh, let for since most alpha sources also emit gamma radiation, lead line containers are needed. Okay. So in general, keep all radioactive materials in lead containers when not in use. Oh, and that's end uh, of our lecture today. So I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this lecture and uh, I'll see you again in the future.